Thanks for coming back to the Shifting Schools podcast. My name is Trisha Friedman. This episode is going to delight your ears if you are curious about the other industries that AI is bound to influence. I am so excited to bring you a conversation with Dwight Gunning, a data scientist who knows more about the world of finance and tech than anybody else I know. So if you think that AI is just a flash in the pan, this episode is going to help you to really think again. Dwight is here to break down the influence that AI has already had in the financial sector and what this means for those of us who are preparing students for a career, perhaps in that field as well. So we're going to explore how Dwight Gunning's very unique journey from economics to IT has given him a unique perspective on how, again, AI, it's not a buzzword, it's not a flash in the pan, it has influence in just about all aspects of society and life. What I love about this conversation is that Dwight also has some incredibly practical insights for those of us who are helping students learn to be better collaborators. So in the show notes, you can learn more about Dwight Gunning's work. If you've got students who are interested in working in finance or uh, data science, he's a great person to point them to. Before we get into our conversation, we do have a brief word from our show sponsor. Are you in the middle of your teaching career and wondering how to best manage your finances? Money Pickles Financial Advisors specialize in helping educators like us. They offer practical advice on investments, savings, and even navigating pension plans. With Money Pickle, you're not just getting an advisor, you're gaining a financial partner who understands your unique needs as an educator. Head to moneypickle.com slash shifting schools today to sign up for a complimentary, no obligation video call with a financial advisor. That's moneypickle.com slash shifting schools. We thank them for being a sponsor of this podcast and of educators at large. And with that, welcome to the show, Dwight Gunning. Dwight Gunning, thank you so much for being with our listeners today. Uh, We are an educational podcast that believes in making sure that our listeners have access to folks who work in different industries so that we are reminded that we are preparing students for a future where the world of work is constantly evolving. Uh, And our emphasis here is looking at artificial intelligence, the role that that plays in a wide variety of jobs and industries. So can we ask you to start things off by talking about the role that AI plays in your work specifically? Um, You know, again, I I know that you, you kind of wear many different hats. You refer to yourself as a data scientist. That's not all that you do. Um, But can you give us a basic explanation of why AI is a main feature of the work that you do and why that's important. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. Um, it has allowed me to think about my career and how uh, AI influences it. So AI, as we currently know, is just the latest stop on in terms of my journey, what I do um, and what a lot of people do, right? Um, I started as uh, as an economist, uh, did that for seven years, and I transitioned into internet um information technology, computing. I did um, a software development. And along the way, things have evolved to the point where AI or the latest iterations of AI have become the most important tools to help us understand um, finance. Um, So my background is in finance. I I do IT for financial companies. So currently I am a ML insurance engineer at, um, at a financial regulator, which means I help to test applications that use machine learning to figure out things about 
people's behavior, activity, activity of the markets, et cetera. So it's, it has become increasingly clear, especially since, um, as you know, chat GPT in, in November 2022, how important it is for us to use it, to understand it, to see how it impacts finance. Well, and I'm, I'm guessing, you know, sometimes I'll be talking with people who are very afraid of technology and they will say like, I really, I hate technology. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm always interested in where that fear comes from. So sometimes I'll say, well, would you want to go to a hospital where the doctors there, the practitioners, the admin, they don't have any knowledge of technology. Is that the hospital that you would want care in? And immediately they're like, no, of course. And I'm wondering in the world of finance, does that link apply as well? Like, should I want to invest with a bank that is also not staying up to date with technology? Uh, could you speak to why, again, the world of finance is always going to be connected to the world of technology too? What, what does that mean for, um, for the average person who's not sort of like a super venture capitalist, but is just kind of doing their day-to-day -day banking uh, or financial life? Yeah, so I guess you have to understand that things are evolving around us anyway. So regardless of whether we're fearful or not, we have to be up to date with it. So if you think back in the 1990s when you had the, the there was a dot-com boom, there was also a company called PayPal where you could send transactions to people or receive payments for, for things. Um, one of the hindrances before launching PayPal was the fact that, well, yes, there's going to be a lot of... Um, uh, financial threats out there. There's going to be a lot of fraud and transactions. So how do you solve that? So what PayPal had to do was de develop um, algorithms for detecting fraud so that it would brought down the, the level of fraud to the level where you, people could become comfortable with it. So the way I would think about it is I'd want to know that I have a bank that is comfortable using AI, machine learning, and algorithms so that it reduces the threat that I have to face. Right. So to, to detect if someone is logging into my account from somewhere across the world. So that's how I would think about it. It's sort of important in helping to build trust. Trust, But um, again, we can talk about the, the other side of it. There are other on the other side, there are negatives as well. So we can talk about that later. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I want to kind of go back to what you mentioned about initially you were an economist and listeners. I'll point out like Dwight's. Uh, experience is incredible. Like you've had a remarkable career going from organization to organization. And I am kind of curious, were you an economist who became interested in technology or were you always interested in both things at the same time? Like, you know, the, the Dwight Gunning of 15, 20 years ago, would he have been surprised to have learned about your career as it currently stands today? Or did you always think that you were going to be working at this intersection of finance and technology? Um, I would say I did not know at the time. So in general, there are two things about me. Um, I'm interested in learning things, right? So that's one thing. And the second thing, I was just interested in figuring out how the world works. So I, I, growing up, I was always a keen interest on, in history and um, how, how things are changing and so on. And in the mid-1990s, right, I started as an economist in 1995, but you could see the dot-com bubble, sorry, dot-com um well, it was a bubble until 2000, but you could see that trend happening where you could see, well, people have their computers and are able to do their own transactions. So to my mind, that's when I started getting interested in it because I could see a picture of a world that's changing and I wanted to go to the world that is changing. So, um, and I guess the second thing was, I was keenly interested in figuring out, well, how do I put my skills of learning stuff and always learning stuff to use? And with computing, there's always a tutorial that teaches you to do something. So it's like a continuous learning in terms of tutorials and, and trying stuff and just the joy of getting stuff done. So that's when I, I made a shift into, um, into computing. I love that, Dwight, because what we talk about in K-12 education all the time is, you know, if, if I'm a literature teacher, what I really want is my students to want to read for forever, right? Like that's kind of a big goal. We talk about lifelong learning and it's easy to talk about. It's harder to instill. And I'm wondering, you know, you're describing yourself as a lifelong learner. Is that something that you felt like 
you were born with, that your family encouraged? Uh, did you feel like you had a teacher who helped you kind of understand like this is valuable to enjoy learning or to even realize like there's something that I don't know yet, but I can I can learn about it. You know, there there is almost a little bit of a confidence in being willing to say that thing that I don't understand. I just don't understand it yet. What do you attribute your lifelong learning mindset to? Where did that come from? Yeah, interesting question. I think everybody has their own personal journey that gets you to where you are. So I'm a lifelong learner. But I think if I think about it, um, I grew up um, the single boy in a, with three sisters as an introvert. And my parents had a set of encyclopedias. So that was where I spent my time. So I read encyclopedias back to front, back to back, uh, front to back, every single article. So that just gave me two things. One is it's a joy of learning things, getting new um, things into my brain. And the second thing is I just wasn't specific in what I wanted to learn. So that just gave, I like to learn music. I learned to learn history, everything. So um, coming forward to the present day, you don't have encyclopedias like you had then, but you have like the internet is right there on the phone. So every student right now has the ability to do what I did, but in a different path to actually try and try different things to see if, you know, if learning this thing or a topic or history or anything would help. Does that stimulate you? So you again, you also need someone to help steer you as well. So maybe there's there's a mentor that can help you to say, okay, there are different topics, right? And but again, that was just my personal path. Um, everybody has their own. Oh, I thank you for sharing that that personal history. It it you know again, it just reminds me that you very much are the definition of a modern day Renaissance man. You have different skills, different interests, and it's about that combination. You know, there's been research that suggests even when we're talking about professional sports and athletics. There's a huge benefit for young people not just playing one sport all the time and being so hyper specific to it. But, um, you know, we're, we're kind of in coming towards Super Bowl season and Patrick Mahomes himself played a lot of different sports growing up. So a lot of people kind of say there's an advantage to don't just limit yourself to one field. Um, you know, be really open minded about learning about different things. That's what you do. So I'm wondering, you know, the, the skills that you have, the positions you talk to, you know, the, the different kind of mindsets that are there, what skills or mindsets do you think are crucial? So for maybe a high school, grade 11, grade 12 student who's interested in doing the kind of work that you do, what are some skills that you're saying work on this or make sure this is the mindset that you have um, as you get closer to you know, your future career? What would you say is really useful there? Uh, I mean, I would say each person has to look introspectively at what they're strong at and then try to, try to pick a, a skill that's on the opposite of that. So uh, I remember talking to my son and saying, would you want to do um, improv, right? Um, because improv is something, a skill that's not taught in schools per se. Um, and it's a skill that's on the opposite side of what he, he, he's good at, but it, it enables him to, um, to exercise the brain in a different way, right? So improv is one, um, speaking, acting. So look at what topics are being taught in school and try and add additional skills on top of that. So I would say if you draw a circle, and keep drawing uh, boxes of what you're good at, what is taught in schools, and keep drawing boxes on the opposite side and try and add those skills to you. So if you're good at um, software development, try and become better at speaking, right? If you're good at art, try and become better at math or music and try and mix that because you never quite know exactly where your career will take you. Uh, and you want to be able to, to shift as things happen. Oh, finding that balance. That's great advice. And, uh, you know, I wonder how unique you find that is in your world. You know, for you personally, where was your strength? What was the balance that you had to find? Like, what did you find came really easily for you? And what was on the other side of making sure that you were balancing your skills, if you don't mind kind of sharing a personal example? Yeah, so I was always really good at 
well, I, I would imagine I was always really good at software development and programming. I could craft programs and so on. And, and I could speak to the computer as you were. But early in my career, I struggled with um, on teams, especially with, um, uh, well, of course, you'd mentioned like office politics or office um, hub dynamics in, on the office and so on. So I all as my career progressed, I deliberately tried to get myself a little bit better at listening, starting to not see myself as the great software developer per se, but trying to see myself as of someone who can talk to per to people and understand what they want, take different perspectives in. And toward the, this part of my career, I think I'm pretty good at understanding or having empathy in terms of what other people who aren't like great software developers are thinking about because they have a perspective. So so that's that's one thing is learning to have empathy for other people, trying to understand why they are thinking the way they are. So that and that helps with team building as well. So that's that's how I um how I got better as a software developer by becoming a more rounded person. I love what you're talking about because you're talking about the reality that, you know, collaboration is crucial. I know that sometimes in K-12 education, when we're talking to students about that, sometimes it seems like, uh, you know, we're, we're being dramatic about just how critical those you know, and we refer to them as soft skills, which sometimes I think even labeling it as a soft skill is misleading because it's essential. And, you know, you talked about mentorship, you've talked about being able to have empathy, compassion, work with others. And Dwight, you've coached and not just coached, but you've also won an event that's called the Create-A-Thon. Uh, there's a great link about it that we'll include in the show notes. I was fascinated reading about this competition. And I'm wondering if you could say more about why challenges like that are good for team building or are good for, again, fostering innovation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's interesting as well. So I was extremely lucky being at the company that I am. They have a, an event called the Create-A-Thon, where for three days each year, you have the ability to, to form groups or teams with all the people in, in the organization and try and compete to get you know, the best idea. Um, and you, you, you present and you can win, right? So um, early on, and this is a lesson that I learned as well, because I might think I'm brilliant and I have a great idea and I put it forward, right? And then... I didn't win the first few years and I didn't even come to the finals and make the finals in the first few years. What I've learned um, since then is that it's not necessarily about um, being brilliant or having brilliant people on your team or, or, um, or having a brilliant idea. You really want to have an ensemble of brilliant people operating at 80% of their skill sets. So, but the idea, there's an overlap in skills. There's a, there's a, um, so you'd have a mix of business, you'd have a mix of technology, UI development, and the interaction among you is where the, the brilliance of the idea comes from. In other words, you're shaping the idea based on different perspectives, and it comes together in something you can package to the organization, and it's, it just makes it a lot sharper at the end, right? So I once I learned to step back from my own brilliance and try and embrace other people and, and just thinking about the collaboration about, um, of the idea, that's when um, it became, um, I started a winning tradition. I mean, I coached in 2020 um, and almost won in 2022. And in 2023, I, did, I, I also won, right? So I've been carrying that philosophy all the way through. Well, it's clearly working for you. And again, I, I think that schools sometimes also, you know, will have hackathons. Uh, we will see competition as not a way for it to just be about, you know, one team beating the other or saying I defeated the other. Um, but it can also be a catalyst for thinking in ways that, you know what, I would not have come up with that solution to that problem unless I had a time limit, I had some restraints, or I did have kind of competitors. Um, you know, I've read a lot about the work that Netflix did in trying to come up with their um, recommender algorithm and how they had a competition for a series of years. And they really feel like it was that competition that helped them get to, you know, their, their uh, recommender system is secretive, but they also attribute a lot of their success to it. And for folks who maybe don't know the story of that competition, there was also this option where teams could decide instead of me being a separate team from yours, hey, 
let's merge and then let's kind of share our work and become a larger team. Um, so, you know, for somebody that's listening and they're hearing you talk about create a and they're thinking, you know what? Yes, maybe I want to set up some sort of competition so that problem solvers that I teach or that I coach can just get practice thinking a little bit differently. As a coach, uh, which is a great responsibility, when you are approaching a competition, do you have any advice for somebody who's leading individuals through you know, a challenge where, as you said, listening is important. We want to make sure that we're welcoming to ideas. We're not necessarily just shooting ideas down. How do you or what is an approach that you've had where people are really listening to one another. You know, you mentioned PayPal, there would have been a time when someone would have said the idea for that system and other people would have said, that's wild. Nobody will use that. And then of course, you know, here we are all of these years later and PayPal is very successful. So how do we create a space where we're not just saying to one another, your idea is bad or that would never work? How do we, how do we help people just be really open-minded to suggestions or solutions to problems that are completely new and novel? So um, that's, a, that's a really good question. So what I've always tried to do um, on my teams is to rewrite what, I, what I'm hearing. So if I'm hearing someone pitch an idea, I'm rewriting it in terms of what's essential about what they're trying to tell me. Because it, even if the idea, that specific idea they're telling me is bad, might not work, or their better ideas, there's something that they are trying to tell as well. So you ask a follow-up question. So you, you have to you have to have the skills or the ability to accept something, even if they're they're pitching you know um, a specific thing. There is some value in whatever they're saying, right? So you're trying to assess what is the value and get them to think about it as well. Can you think about it in a different way? Or the other thing is we are shaping an idea together. Um, and so you sort of round robin and you, you listen from different perspectives and see, just rewrite what each person is saying until you have a clearer picture. Because again, you're shaping a group idea that will win. You have to sell it to a judge. So at the point it has to become sharp. But until then, there's no idealist final. So at the first day of the creator thought, it's never the final final idea. And once everybody's on board with that and say, we're shaping this together, that, that, that I think works or has worked for my teams. That's great advice. And I, I love the idea of it doesn't have to be about loving the whole idea, but is there a part of it that you can build on? I think that's brilliant advice. Dwight, earlier you mentioned, you know, the work that you do, um, you know, Fi financial institutions are going to need AI for protection in part because AI can also be used as a weapon. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot to educators about developing AI literacy and needing to understand how it works, not at the detail that someone like you understands, but also really getting that AI, it's not about it showing up in our lives in some imaginary future but understanding it, it's here in our day to day lives now. You know, I referenced the Netflix algorithm uh, recommender system. Anybody that's streaming any entertainment service, you know, that's a company that's trying to figure out what have you watched so that they can recommend more. And, and sometimes when I'm talking about that system, uh, people will say, well, that doesn't have a big influence. And actually, according to Netflix's own research, 80, 80% of the content that gets viewed gets viewed because of that system. And so I think that does bring up some broader questions around, well, if I'm not always driving the content that I consume, like if I'm a passive consumer, I, I think there's some ramifications of that. And so anyway, I, I bring this up because I think it's really important to learn more about these things because there is an impact on society and there can be a positive impact, but there can also be a negative one. Can you say a little bit more about, again, the learning that you have done and how in finance specifically, we need to be aware of the opportunities, how this can help keep our, our money safe, uh, but also where the risks are. How how do you sort of have a foot in both of those worlds? Yeah, so again, the interesting thing about finance is finance is a, 
it, as you were, it's a fiction that's based on trust. So if you have no trust, there's no finance. So if you think back to when we traded things, I have, you have a fish, I have a, an apple, whatever. We traded it, but we traded it based on a story that said, I'm not going to give you what I have. I'm going to give you something intermediate, a stone, like whatever, but you can take it to someone else and trade it. That's a story and the story is backed by trust. So underneath finance is a story of trust, right? So, um, and as we have progressed now to technology, we need to be able to trust that um, uh, when we make transactions, the other person on the other side um, isn't going to take advantage of us. Now, as AI becomes part of that mix, then you, you have the issue of, well, are we going to be able to trust the AI algorithms again, right? Because that now, that now becomes part of what we need to be concerned about. So in 2008, for example, you had the, the complex financial securities that nobody understood at the time that caused a break in trust. Is AI going to cause that lack of trust today? So those are some of the negative things that we have to think about that might happen. Um, again, on the other side, there's opportunities for AI helping and enhancing work, and we have to be aware um, of those possibilities as well, um, especially in finance, but in other areas of education. I can give specific examples um, as we progress the interview. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear more about your examples because, you know, I, I, it's interesting to me as you are talking about the work that you do, I feel like you're also talking about human psychology. I love the metaphors that you're using. So, you know, I, I also just get a sense that the work that you do, you're thinking about so many different subject areas, um, you know, and, and at the core that it's all about trust, I think is really interesting, because you're talking about our emotional state, which, you know, at before we had this conversation, if I were to imagine somebody working in your sector, um, would I think that they would be, you know, so interested in human psychology, I totally would not have made that connection before, Dwight. So you're really helping me just debunk some of the myths that I've told myself about that industry. But yeah, please proceed with the more examples. I'm just I'm fascinated by your contributions and already grateful to uh, you coming on the show. Yeah, and and yeah, and again, um, the other aspect of um, AI is, or the other aspect of finance that's tied into AI is, um, you can be. You can think of, AI, of finance as just being a numbers game, which is just numbers in a spreadsheet, finance, and so on. But there's a story behind every company. So the, when you have a valuation of a company, it's based on, for let's say, Uber. There is the story of a company going into different uh, cities, signing up um, taxi drivers. Um, and the, there's a story about how, how much money, uh, how it would both get drivers and employees and so on. And then you could feed that story into a valuation of the company. And this similarly is every company has a valuation, but the valuation is based on the story about the company. In other words, a human has to look at it and say, does that story make sense? And if it does, then that's a value for it. So there's a financial, sorry, there's a numerical way of thinking about companies and finance, and there's also a story-based way of thinking about um, finance and so on. And that ties into the fact that the artificial intelligence that we have now it's capable of both. It's capable of crunching numbers, but it's also capable of reading a story and understanding a company or generating it. So, for example, you can actually go to tools now and, add and say, tell me a little bit about this company. Tell me where the sales are going to come and so on. So AI is going to become much more important in us trying to understand finance, both on the number side and on the story side, the human, how we think about it. Yeah, I mean... I don't know if this example kind of connects to that, but often, you know, a lot of schools will have a mission statement. They'll have values. So sometimes an exercise I'll do is, you know, here, ChatGPT, here's what this school says their values and their mission is. If that's to be true, can you give me 10 steps or 10 actions that students would experience that would bring that mission to life? And it kind of becomes an interesting point of comparison of, is this happening in our school? Uh, and has ChatGPT, you know, actually really interpreted that those values in that mission statement in a way um, that rings true to us? Yeah, um, and I'm interested in in that those sort of use cases where you're using the AI or the ChatGPT to interpret a mission. For example, you could say what the 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 mission statement is, 
And then you could ask it to generate a set of concrete steps for how you should plan your lesson plans in the following year. So in other words, you're not just, you're, you are conversing with the AI, what your, your overall goals is, goals are, and that it will then translate into specific things. So, um, I'm interested particularly in how can we use AI to, um, to manage, to, to, to manage or to, to make concrete, you know, words that we, or thoughts that we have. How can we use it to generate things that help us? Right. So, um, yeah, so, that, so I've been playing with a few ways of using prompts, and I don't know if I should talk about prompts as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always love hearing, like, you know, I think that's one of the best things that we can be doing right now is sharing with one another the examples, because I feel like every time I have that conversation with somebody, we both realize I wouldn't have thought to have done that before. So please do share the, the way that you're playing around with prompts. Yeah, so I guess the, the key thing is, we are in a phase where we are now talking to a computer in natural language. That didn't happen before. Like when I started my career, the way we talked to the computer was in programming languages is that you took two or three years to learn before you could do it. Now we're talking in English. Now we're talking in, in we're just talking to the computer. We're asking it to do things. Um, and the thing is, it's easy to get started, but it's critical that we understand how we can do it. And it, we, so I would recommend that we take time to practice. So if you're doing a task or, or uh, you can ask the AI to generate an email or start an email or generate a task list. And over time, as you see the limitation, as you see how the computer is talking back to you, you'll become better at figuring out where its strengths and weaknesses are and how you can use it. Um, and I think it's also critical for, um, for to teach students how to actually use prompts because I would imagine in 20 years, there's no programming languages anymore. There, we're just talking to a computer, talking to an AI, and it will become natural. So that's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm keen to see happen um, in the next 10, 20 years. I'm fascinated to hear you say that you're keen to see it happen because, of course, you have all of that extensive knowledge in, in pro programming language. And I, I that's something that I've been curious about is... Um, Yes, this technology and, you know, often people will say the technology, the AI technology that we are using today is the worst AI technology that we're going to use. You know, it, it's just only going to increasingly improve. And can you just say a little bit more about how you're optimistic about that future? Because I, I guess I would have assumed, Dwight, and you just have me checking all my assumptions in this conversation. I would have assumed that for someone like you with your extensive knowledge um, that you would be, I don't know, maybe a little sad to see some of the program language not necessarily be a must have. Um, is that, is there any part of you kind of grieving that? Uh, can you say a little bit more about why you're excited for that future? I don't know if I'm grieving. Uh, as I said, I'm just interested in seeing how the world evolve, how history evolves, and I'm seeing it happen right now. So I'm actively deprecating or depreciating my, my, my knowledge. In, in tech and trying to become better at the new tech, which is just natural language, speaking to a computer, right? So um, over the course of the last couple of years, prompt engineering, I'm trying to become better at that. Um, there are some frameworks that allow you to, um, to to structure your prompts or to structure a better way of talking to a computer. I'm, I'm interested in it. I'm interested in the research. Um, and again, there's another analogy about AI as well, right? So this, it's called a sports analogy of AI. So you can think of it, um, for example, um, this is in track and field, for example. If you, you can think of AI as being like steroids, which give you a short-term benefit, but long-term, it doesn't give you a gain, right? Or you can think of it um, as the, I don't know if you know the Nike sneakers that allow it to run 5% faster. Mm -hmm. Is it something that give you a, a specific long-term game over time? And the third level you can think of it is AI can actually be a coach, right? That actually helps you become better at some tasks. For example, um, I'm actually using um, ChatGPT um, and there are also specific apps called, uh, that help you to learn German, for example. So, um, and it's more of a conversational. So you can actually open ChatGPT on your phone and talk to it in a conversation. You can say, pretend to be this for me. So uh, um, I think we have to start thinking of it in those terms 
um, either as a, the something like a sneaker or verse or more importantly as a coach, that's where you can see um, like a benefit because those are those are things that you know um, in the future will help us become a lot more productive. Yeah, I you know one of the things that I love using ChatGPT for is I come across a concept that. I think I kind of understand it, but maybe I don't. And just asking it, can you break this down to me at this level, you know, that would be understandable for an eight-year-old at a level for a middle school student? Can you also then bring that concept up that would be understood to someone who's a graduate level student? And I have found actually looking at a concept or an idea from different levels to be really informative, but also, as you say, it kind of always coaches me to want to learn a little more. So often when I'm talking about AI in education, there's a lot of people that say, oh no, this is going to be the end of creativity. And I feel like it's the opposite. I think this is going to give folks access to ideas. Um, you know, I think if I were a young entrepreneur who wanted to start my own business, the benefit of having a tool like this, you mentioned like creating task lists, um, you know, just for kind of my day to day, sometimes I'll have it create a task list, but also recommend how much time to spend on each. I might not follow that advice, but it's useful for me to see, whoa, if I'm spending two hours on something that maybe this is suggesting it should be 15 minutes, maybe I just want to think about that a little bit differently. So I very much feel like this is going to be a way that folks get access to different careers, um, you know, in ways that they would not have had necessarily before. Do you think that it would be fair for me to say, for somebody who thinks they want to go into finance, for a high school student who's thinking, I want to go into the world of finance, do you think it will be impossible to work in finance, let's just say five years from now, and not in some way or another also need to have some sense of AI literacy. I don't necessarily need to be a Dwight Gunning level data scientist, but will I need to know a little bit about those tools? Will anybody be able to work in finance without having some skill level with AI, do you think? So I think that having some knowledge about AI will supercharge your ability to learn finance. So um, if you think about 20, 30 years, you used to have to buy these books and these books had a lot of numbers and uh, books, a lot of formulas, and it took years for you to get it. And then you get an entry level job and learn finance by going through that. You can shortcut a lot of that by asking the computer because a lot of information is inside the AI. So if you are able to, to have a conversation with the AI, you can actually go to tools now. You can say, tell me more about this company. Tell me the financials of, of the company, um, whether what is the, the gr expected growth rate and so on. So a lot of the complicated stuff, you, all, you basically outsource to the AI. But if you become better at speaking to it, it I think it would cut like five years off your your ability to get into into finance if you can learn how to talk to the tools. So yeah, I, I agree. It'd be very difficult, maybe in maybe in a five years, maybe in ten years, to not know AI and be in finance. But if for sure, it will give you a leg up if you start that way and work yourself into it. Yeah, and I you know I know sometimes people will hear the word shortcut and they'll think, well, is that cheating? Um, and, and, you know, I maybe this is an example of what you're talking about, but I also will use ChatGPT sometimes if, you know, there's a tricky email that I have to respond to. Sometimes I'll help ask it to help me with the drafting of it, right? Uh, and it won't always be that I take that version, but it's like it gives me a good rough draft. So it gives me a shortcut to the better draft. And I don't feel like that's cheating because often what that will mean for me is I have more energy in my day to deal with some other things. So I feel like it's actually, you know, sometimes people hear, you know, the phrase like it will make you more productive. And it's not that I am necessarily like doing so much more. I would almost say I'm doing certain things better and I have more energy for the really important human 
interactions, like, you know, conversations like these. Do you have any thoughts in terms of what you mentioned and somebody, oh, you know, what Dwight's talking about is they're, they're just cheating. You know, they're going to take these shortcuts and then not understand. I just want to be really clear. At least my interpretation is that's not what you're talking about at all. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's quite correct. Um, those examples you gave are, are exactly what um, the tools will help you with. To, to some extent, for example, uh, if you're looking at in schools where you're at, you're, you're assessing someone's ability to write an essay and then seeing if they learn just by how it was presented. And if that's, that's the, the way that it was done before, and then chat GPT can, can allow people to cheat that in itself, um, unless we change how we think about the exercise and think about how people actually learn and think about a task that they, we, we want them to do, right? So unless we change the mindset and how we, we approach learning, how we approach in, introducing the tools, we will we'll always have a view of it as, for example, steroids that give a short-term benefit. But I think, um, and this is from uh, Harvard's experience with introducing ChatGPT into their courseware, Right, they introduced a chatbot that allowed them to have like a one-to-one -one interaction with um, with students. So in other words, a chat um, interface became like an instructor, right? So it gave them that one-to-one -one because these are massive. There's a shortage of teachers, etc. Um, and also, you can you can add guardrails in it so that it, it will allow it sorry, will prevent just blatant cheating, for example. Or right? it, it it's it, it is designed for you to. It was designed to support. The learning experience. So design matters with AI. So you can't just simply just introduce it. You have to think about from a school's perspective, what are we trying to achieve here? And how do we get the students to use it in such a way that we also um, see their growth? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I think this is a huge time to be reimagining what's the point of assessment? What's the point of schools? And we started our conversation with you really talking about lifelong learning, right? Like that's what we, that's what we want. Dwight, you're, you've been such a fascinating interviewee and you've been talking about all of these different other kind of case studies that you watch, other businesses, you know, you, you have to be kind of looking at the future through the lens of what you see happening today. And I'm wondering if in closing, you might tell listeners just sort of about something that you have your eyes or your mind on, like you want to follow where this story goes uh, or this subject. And I don't know if that's a specific business or a certain emerging market that you just like following in the news right now because you're very curious about it. You're just such a curious person. And I wonder if you could leave us with just some a story that you're following right now that you're curious to learn more about. Um. Well, I guess staying in AI, I'm curious about just expanding beyond just a text-based AI. I'm interested in seeing where it goes with entertainment. So you have the image generators, you have also video generators. Will AI enhance our ability to do storytelling? So I'm interested in that. Um, again, that's that's on the other side of my skill set. I'm in finance, I'm in text, I'm in numbers. I'm interested in visual storytelling. So where does that go? How does that, where will that lead? Um, so I play a, a lot of times with Dali or BitJourney or these tools that allow it to generate things. And that just exercises a different part of my brain. So I'm, I, I think um, that, that I'm interested in, I, I think that will become, you know, uh, in addition to just the, 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 the text, it'll become more, more, much more exciting, much more compelling. Yeah, in the future. Yeah, I, I've been following too, just what this is going to mean for music. Um, and, and again, I, I, I do think it's for folks who maybe in the past have felt like a creative future, you know, working in one of those fields is, oh, am I, am I not a creative person? I feel like these are tools that I also love playing around with. Um, and it's, you talked a lot about like learning how to talk with this technology. Midjourney is an incredible example where, you know, for folks who are in that discord and you're watching in real time, some of the other prompts that people are using for anyone who's not used that before, I know that sometimes people think it's like one or two sentences. 
it's not. It's like, you know, we've got like huge mega prompts that are so descriptive that will often have very specific artistic or, uh, you know, photography terminology in there. Like, I feel like I've learned more about photography through text to image generators than anywhere else. So thank you for landing us with that final example. And you're just proving my point that you really are a Renaissance man. We've been so fortunate to get some of your expertise. Dwight, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, you're, you're really having me feel really optimistic about the future and also just realizing that even in a world where technology is booming, you know, we're on the cusp of this huge, just new frontier that human centered skills, things like listening, things like collaboration, those are not going out of date. Those are in a, in an interesting, ironic way coming to the forefront and I think are going to become more critical um, to the work that we do. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I was excited to be here. I'm happy. Um, I'm sure I'm going to listen to this episode. Out, but yeah, I'm excited um, to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Jeff and I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. And we wanted to thank you for some of your feedback. We had a number of listeners reach out in the past month to tell us that they were looking for strategies to help them use AI for feedback in the classroom. So we took your feedback on and we're very excited about an upcoming webinar. It will be hosted April 9th. It is entitled AI Fueled Feedback. It's specifically designed to empower educators like you with strategies to help you reimagine feedback in the era of AI. From now until March 5th, you can sign up for this webinar at the early bird price of 65 US dollars. To learn more about AI Fueled Feedback and to join Jeff and I for a 75 minute webinar, you can head to www.shiftingschools.com or by heading over to the show notes. We hope to catch you at the April 9th webinar. Thanks again and see you next week.